paupers presumably had no civil rights over their own bodies and what would happen to them afterwards? No, there's, um, there's a piece of legislation, it's called the Anatomy Act of 1832, and it basically says that for the crime of poverty, and it was regarded as a crime at the time, you will be dissected. It was your fault that you'd not climbed up out of the situation. And the way to repay your welfare debt, for Jess, is to go for dissection. So we'll care for you in life, provided that you repay your welfare debt to society in death. I always think of the Victorians as philanthropic, very religious, God-fearing, charitable, kind. And yet, if you were living on the poverty line, you were considered scum. You were a criminal because you'd never made it up to the next rung of the ladder. And because of that, you were penalised. So much so that you gave your body when you died. That was it. And what happened to Friend? We know he was 92 when he died in the workhouse. Was his body chucked out with the rubbish? By the beginning of the 20th century, Britain was accelerating into the modern age. Cars were appearing on the roads, the telephone was becoming widely used, and the first X-ray machines were being installed in London's private hospitals. The workhouse, too, was modernizing. The standard of food, education, and health care inside was now better than the conditions a pauper could expect outside. But despite the material improvements, Workhouse inmates remained tainted by the stigma of failure. Barbara Taylor Bradford's mother, Frieda, was in Ripon Workhouse as a little girl aged six. It's a bit of a shock because, well, p people look down on families that went into the workhouse. Barbara's biographer, Piers Dudgeon, has found a clue as to why Barbara's family ended up in the workhouse. Their meeting outside the Ripon house, where Barbara's mother, Frida, was born. What are these papers you're holding? Well, now, come on, show them. They've uh, got a secret, I'm sure. Th well, this tells us, uh, this is in 904. fact... 1904. 1904. Uh, this is a birth certificate. Yes. It is a birth certificate of a little girl called... Frida. Frida. My mother. Let me see the date. Yes, 3rd of June, 1904. Mother, Edith, Edith Walker, Walker, domestic servant, living at 9A Water Skullgate. And but what's that? There's a cross through it. Name of father. Name of father is left blank. Uh, oh. And oh. So what we, all that we know is that uh, 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 Edith Are came you back. telling me my mother was illegitimate? Yes. Uh, that seems to be without a doubt. A very interesting situation. We have Frida, the firstborn, uh, with no father on the birth certificate. And then we have the name of the second child she has, again illegitimately, Fred. So Frida and Fred. And then we have a third child. Yes, name of father missed off. So she is having these children now at regular intervals. Well, I hope it was the same man. But the only difference that we have between these three uh, birth certificates yes. is that Edith had her first child at 9A. Yes, in Water that Skullgate. room there. And alone. the next two she had at this place, 75 All Hallowgate. Whose house was that? 75 All Hallow Gate isn't a private residence at all. It's the address of Ripon Workhouse. Oh dear. Barbara's grandmother Edith came here in 1907 and again in 1910 to give birth, having been shunned by her family. There were over 7,000 illegitimate births a year in workhouses all over the country as the institution was increasingly being used by the poor for free health care. In Glasgow, Brian Cox's great-grandfather Patrick McCann suffered a serious injury, rendering him disabled and unemployed at the age of 40. His wife had died, making him a single parent 
bringing up his son Samuel, age six, by himself. Patrick and Samuel were familiar faces at the poorhouse gates. 24th of July, 1899. Another application from Patrick. Got bronchitis. Grant order for self and boy. 11th of February, 1901. Order granted for Barnhill Poorhouse for self and Samuel. Certified with bronchitis. Following month, he reapplies. 1902, 1903, 1903, 1903. Just kept going in and out. It's unbelievable. And the boy, this is his life. Poor house to poor house to poor house, this wee boy. In, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. Doesn't make any sense. It's just, uh, it's just, a, it's just appalling. Patrick was a sick man when he went into the poor house. But the moment he was well enough to work, he was thrown out. He would then fall sick again. Go in to be patched up, only to end up back on the streets. For 14 years, Patrick was put through this ordeal time and time again, as his health became forever worse. He's a statistic, my great-grandfather. All related to poverty, all related to why, how we don't take care of people. It's this assault on human dignity, this endless assault on human dignity. We've got to rub their faces in it, you know. But this, look at it, the whole book is about that, you know. Ridiculous. And then, oh my God, the 19th of June. The 19th of June, 1911, Patrick McCann is declared insane by Dr. Thomas. Oh, it's just awful. I mean, it's just down this. You know, this spiral into the abyss. And finally, he goes nuts on Christ. Patrick was 54 years old when he was sent to Gartlock Asylum. At the time, he was one of 45,000 old and infirm paupers who were moved from workhouses to asylums around the country because the authorities didn't know what else to do with them. By today's standards, the treatment they received was primitive physical exercise for therapy, and opium for sedation. Charlie Chaplin's mother, Hannah, was also committed to an asylum after she was separated from him in Lambeth Workhouse. Charlie was sent to live in a school for poor children, miles away from the life he'd known. He was one of over 800 pupils here at Hanwell Industrial School. Alongside literacy and numeracy, Children were also taught trades like carpentry, metalwork and tailoring to set them up for future employment. Today, Charlie's Old School is a community and sports centre. I can imagine most children when they got here, including my grandfather, they must have been extremely malnourished, frail. Yeah, I'm a children who came from the centre of town, which is where Charlie came from would have been some of the poorest children in London. In fact, probably some of the poorest children in the country, actually. They had physical activity, sports? They did. I mean, they, they were taught how to swim. And running, jumping, yeah. tumbling, yeah. Uh, jumping over ropes, yeah. uh, skipping. Sports were quite important. It makes me wonder, because my grandfather in his work, he was very physical. He was his own stuntman. He, would, he knew how to walk on a tight rope. He knew how to roller skate. He knew how to, to fall and roll. So I, I wonder if this is the place where he learnt a lot of physical activity. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Here's a picture. And this has uh, actually got Charlie down there. Yeah. <laughs> They look like a crafty little bunch. Yeah, they do. Uh, they kind of got chubby faces, so they yeah. must have been you know, pretty well fed. The school wasn't only concerned with the child's physical welfare, but also its moral discipline. The gym used to double up as the punishment room. Penalties included reduced food rations, regular beatings, and being locked up in a windowless cell for up to 24 hours. Every Thursday, the names of uh, the kids that had misbehaved were read out in the playground, uh -huh. and on Friday, they, um, they were punished. All the boys would be 
brought in here and then there'd be a desk like this mm -hmm. and they would be lined up. It was only the boys, the girls weren't, weren't beaten and it was only the boys aged over seven. Charlie's name was read out and he was accused of uh, setting fire to the toilet block and actually Charlie didn't do it but yeah. he decided you know that he was going to say something different so this is what happens. Are you guilty or not guilty he asked. Nervous and impelled by a force beyond my control I blurted out guilty. I felt neither resentment nor injustice but a sense of frightening adventure as they led me to the desk and administered three strokes across my bottom. The pain was so excruciating that it took my breath away. But I did not cry out. And although paralyzed with pain and carried to the mattress to recover, I felt violently triumphant. Being an actress myself, I can kind of see the joy of having the whole room staring at you and getting the punishment, being able to control your emotions and feeling triumphant. I think my grandfather learned a lot of discipline here. Mostly he learned how to become a stronger person and a more independent person and I think after going through this he probably realized that he could get through anything. In 1913, Charlie moved to Hollywood where he turned his experience of poverty into cinema gold with his classic comic persona, The Little Tramp. Two years later, age 26, he was earning the equivalent of $8 million a year, making him one of the highest paid people in the world. He went on to co-found United Artists, still one of the most famous studios in Hollywood today. But Charlie never forgot his mother and rescued Hannah from the asylum in 1921. She spent her last seven years in luxury in California, a world away from the workhouse. Charlie's success may be unique, but the resistance he showed against all the odds is shared by other workhouse inmates. People who took on the system and left a legacy of courage and defiance for future generations. Barbara Taylor Bradford's grandmother came to Ripon Workhouse twice as an unmarried woman to have illegitimate children. Each time she was accompanied by her eldest child, Barbara's mother, Frida. The workhouse has been conserved as a museum, and this is the first time Barbara has set foot in the building. Now she will see for herself the place that her mother kept secret all her life. My mother was six very young to be in the workhouse and I'm sure there was that feeling of, of embarrassment and shame. This is the bathroom of course you see your mother would have had to be bathed when she came in and searched. Anything private was all taken away. Why all private things were taken away? Because you were put into a public workhouse uniform and even your clothes, oh. clothes were taken away. And what is this? Oh, now this is the disinfestation of their clothing to oh. take any lice out or anything I like that. I see. Everything was bundled up and they fumigated it. Your mother would have been dressed. Oh, in... a brown dress and a little... Well, a pinafore, really, A isn't pinafore, it? yes. Over 30,000 children ended up in workhouses every year. The only toys there were had to be shared amongst everybody. All inmates were given three meals a day, a watery porridge called gruel, bread, and occasionally meat. Life was ruled by a strict timetable of work and sleep with little free time. Those who entered the workhouse were often determined never to return. Alma Scaife came here in 1942. She was just six, the same age as Barbara's mother when she was here. What are your memories of, of this workhouse? Just the frightenness. No, very unhappy. Bad memories? Mm. Yeah. Cardboard in your plimsolls to go to school. I not think my bands were going like that, no way. Is that how you went to yes, school? Yes, we did. With cardboard mm. in your, your tennis shoes? You're not proud of it, I hate to say I've lived there, but I'm proud of how, what I've become. When I was growing up, and I was about 16 or 17, my mother said, I want you to have a better life than I had. Mm. 
Did you ever think that or say that to your children? Yes, yes. They had the best of everything. Everything. My children didn't have a hand down like I had. Everything I wore was given. My children, if I had anything given, it went in the bin. So you did give them a better life. Oh, yes, yes. Always Clark shoes. Always ladybird clothes. They've had everything, my children. My mother did say to me many times, I want you to have the kind of life I should have had. And I often wondered what she meant, and I would think, isn't she happy with my father? And they, they seem to be. And I think what she was thinking of is this place. I think being in Ripon Workhouse actually gave her that determination and that toughness and that will to make me have a different life, to give me the opportunities that she didn't have. Basically, to be a lady. Frida's success in bringing Barbara up can be seen as a triumph for the workhouse as a deterrent. But it was also a system that could be devastatingly cruel, especially to those who fell foul of the authorities. In Glasgow, Brian Cox is trying to find out why his sick and disabled great-grandfather, Patrick McCann, was never given the level of health care he needed in the poorhouse. Irene. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, what a saga. It has indeed. So many times in and out, in and yeah. out. Yeah. Is that regular or was he the exception or was he the rule? Well, he goes into the poor house. Um, they are looking to diagnose his health problems and they have decided he's well enough to come out of the poor house after four days and five days each time. He's never in very long, which suggests his health is not chronic in the sense that he's off for months. Sometimes people have been there for months. That's not the case in terms of Patrick. And then in 1905, he's classified as a C10. What does that mean? There's a description in that book here. Can I just get this volume? This one? Yeah. Thank okay, you. there you go. Now, this is what they thought he was. Um, I don't know if you want to look at that category 10 there. 10's class there. <sighs> Bastards. Malingerers and others of questionable character to be sent to Barnhill for further diagnosis, probationary treatment that are after transferred if necessary. Malingera. A malingera. Do you think that was accurate? Probably not, because what they did was at the beginning... But he had this injury. He had an injury um, and he, was, he suffered from bronchitis, but they don't feel that his illness is genuine. They decided about who was the deserving and the undeserving poor, oh, no. and they decided in this case he was undeserving. He was undeserving. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, it is a very harsh system, there's no doubt about it's it. It's horrible. Yeah, it's a horrible system. It's horrible, um, and the man's a victim. Uh-huh, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just atrocious. I mean, times are really harsh, and what you get is lots of cases of drunkenness, criminality. But what it is about most is grinding poverty. That's exactly, what it is. but it's about within grinding. four years, they're sending these people in front of machine guns mm -hmm. to fight a war for them mm -hmm. on their behalf. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, the injustice of it is astonishing. It's astonishing, mm -hmm. and it's an outrage. It's an absolute outrage of what they did to these people. Sadly, that's a lot of people's life in Glasgow. I know, that's what Absolutely. I mean. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not just saying it in terms of my great-grandfather's life. I'm saying that the mm -hmm. system sucks big time. Yeah. And it should not have, never have happened. Yeah. I mean, it is a terrible system. I don't think uh, there's any doubt about appalling. it. Appalling, appalling. Um, I mean, just mm -hmm. cruel beyond belief. Mm -hmm. By classifying people into categories, the workhouse treated paupers according to how deserving they were of help. It was a ruthless system, designed to judge the poor, without ever addressing the problem of how to deal with poverty itself. For my family, who had nothing but appear to be very good people, and they were trying their very, very hardest to do what they could, they were trying not to be a drain on society, and yet the odds were totally stacked against them. They would never have been able to get out of where they are now. Never. How does one climb out of the gloom. How do you do it? 
Fern Britton's ancestor, Jesse Carter, was, in all likelihood, dissected for medical science because his family were too poor to pay for his funeral. Jesse's father, friend, worked all his life to avoid the shame of the workhouse, but the records show he ended up dying there. You can see the reference to friend having been admitted um, to the Strood workhouse when he was about 91 years old. He kept out for 91 mm, years? It's incredible, yes, yeah. So I'll just, um, if we have a look through wow. here. It's, it's, it's quite amazing that, that someone should live that long anyway at this time, especially someone who had probably done sort of a lot of manual labour during his working yes, life. Did. And on this page here, you can see... Carter, friend, there he is. Name of informant, self. Friend managed to bring himself in. On the next page, you've got the actual oh, dates. Oh, I can see the word. Yeah. Dead. Gosh. I don't know why, 120 years later, that is so... You know, you sort of hope that things would have improved for him. Mm. But it didn't. Is the possibility that he had to give his body to medical science too, or what did they do with him? I can shed a little bit more light on, on what happened to, to Friend. Um, obviously... <laughs> Carter, Friend, age 91, parish of Cliff, where buried? Walden. Who would have paid for that burial? Well, can you see those letters? It says F. Family. Family? Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. So they did, they came to collect him? Mm. Looks that way. And they buried him, even though they had nothing. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Well, he must have been very well thought of. <sighs> so he did get a burial somewhere. Yeah. He had a, a proper Christian burial. Wow. One third of all workhouse inmates were over 65 years old. Like thousands of other paupers, Friend had been using the workhouse as a retirement home. And remarkably, after he died, it was discovered that he'd even managed to squirrel away a nest egg. Well, well, well. I suspect that it might have been his money put by for his funeral. His funeral fund? Yeah, yeah. Because So uh, like... he would still not be a drain on the family? Yes. <laughs> even though at the age of 91, finally he had to relinquish himself to the workhouse. Yeah. Nonetheless... He was still fighting that whole issue of being a pauper. Yeah. It's astonishing, really. What a marvellous man. Thank you, Alison. You're very welcome. Thank you. <sighs> Next time, Felicity K. 